All right. Um, it's nice to be here. I am an architect from Amsterdam. I was educated in Delft and also a little bit in Aarhus. So I uh, have learned from the Danish um, subtleties, you know, of looking at towards buildings with more refinement maybe than, than we do. Um, I very much enjoyed it. I have my office in Amsterdam together with uh, Elizabeth, my partner. And um, yeah, we do a variety of projects uh, and usually with timber, I love timber and I've uh, investigated um, healthy interior and uh, healthy materials uh, like clay and straw and so on. And um, yes, this project um, is something very special. In Amsterdam, there are a lot of trees uh, inside of the canals, for instance. There are already 70,000 elm trees. And these trees um, are obviously at some point uh, reaching the end of their uh, life. And people don't like this. If you see an image like this, this is in a park, it's like a, like a murder uh, crime scene, right? You think, who did this? They cut this beautiful tree. People are upset. People don't have a very circular attitude towards trees, right? We don't lose our hair when we get a haircut. Uh, we know that, but in our cities, all trees are holy. But if we don't do anything about it, this is what happened in Utrecht. They left it too long and it's, you know, uh, ripped down uh, half a bridge. So at some point you have to um, rejuvenile your uh, urban trees. Stadshout is an organization in Amsterdam <clears throat> that does things with uh, local trees and people love it. Uh, there is sentimental value involved. Um, many of these uh, trees stood somewhere, you know, and um, they, they actually um, can see where it came from. This is a company, Stadsplank. They make planks where you can see, you know, where this piece of tree was and when it was uh, cut. Um, so people like to remember their trees. Maybe it's also complementary to their, you know, modern interiors. Um, usually there is also a social aspect. For instance, children, when a tree in the schoolyard gets cut, they have a project together and they enjoy, um, you know, working with the material. Um, it can also really be, you know, uh, uh, social for, for adults and, and visitors and people who, who walk around and they enjoy this. So that about the general idea, you know, uh, that the local material, the wood, you know, means something to people. Uh, and it also leads to local labor rather than, you know, foreign bought timber, where you can only hope it is FSC or, or something like that. Um, about this project, a little uh, film was made, which I will show now and it introduces the complete project. And then I will go into some details. Sorry. Yes. Behalve bomen heeft Amsterdam eigenlijk geen grondstoffen. En het gekke is dat toch die bomen tot nu toe meestal in de versnipperaar verdwijnen. De opdracht van de gemeente luidde een overkapping ontmoetingsplek op een open plek in het Amstelpark. En dat was een perfecte opdracht voor Stadshout. De stad staat is opgericht uh, om te voorkomen dat bomen die in Amsterdam gekapt worden uh, ja, de stad verlaten. Terwijl we er ook een heleboel mooie dingen van kunnen maken. Ik ontwierp dit eerste permanente bouwwerk van Stadshout. En ik koos ervoor om het half op die bestaande ronde vijver te plaatsen. Als een soort toevoeging aan de plek die eigenlijk al gedefinieerd was. Voor ons was het met name een uitdaging om uh, met groen hout gewoon een houdbare constructie te bouwen. 
groenhout is vers gezaagd hout. Dat betekent dat het nog moet drogen na het zagen. Tijdens het drogen krimpt het zeker en geeft het ook de mogelijkheid dat het gaat vervormen. Dus een goede selectie van de boomstammen was daarbij belangrijk. Aanvoer van stadsbomen is natuurlijk niet een bos waar je zomaar alle bomen uit kan plukken. Dus het duurde ook even voordat we dat compleet hadden. Stalen knooppunten houden de balken bij elkaar op de plek waar de krachten in het hout het grootste zijn. Je kunt meteen uh, schuiving door krimp uh, en uitzetting opnemen. In een volgend project zouden we kunnen proberen om helemaal zonder staal te werken en om een volledige houtconstructie van te maken. So, this was the introduction to uh, the project. And so that shows how, how it was. Obviously, a, a lot of fun to do. And the great thing is that you get to work with the raw material. It's a bit like a butcher who works with the complete animal rather than, you know, with cuts from the supermarket that have been basically destined, uh, you know, to become certain, uh, you know, um, it's either an osabuco or a osahas or something. It's much more, you know, uh, inspiring to work with the complete material, and then, you know, you start to think about different ways of uh, of cutting it up. Maybe you you make larger beams. You you make different uh, decisions, and also you work with different sorts of timber. So it's not just all, you know, uh, um, industrial, you know, Scandinavian uh, um, um, softwood. It's uh, it's basically trees that you have to your disposal. Uh, there are a lot of elm trees in Amsterdam. Elm trees are elegant. They have a nice light color. They're stable. Um, they're workable. And they're an expression of the Amsterdam, you know, local, uh, local wood. Poplar is light, uh, which is important uh, for the cladding uh, of the building. Um, it has a nice wood grain and it is, you know, readily available. You don't have to wait for months. Uh, there is a lot of it and it's straight as well, long, straight, available. Douglas is a tree uh, that we had to use because the long edge beams of the pavilion were too long for the elm. So we don't usually get that length of elm tree. So you choose something else. And then there's also the beach for the flooring, which is good because it has no splinters. It's not splitting. And it's, you know, a, a safe wood to, for, for, for daily contact and touching and walking. So every uh, sort of timber has its own justification. A lot of CO2 is stored here. Um, this is the equivalent of, I think, 38 electric uh, households annually. So 38 households, one year electricity. That's what's in here. Or 60,000 uh, kilometers with a car, more or less. Now, usually these trees are cut too short. This is because then they fit well in the truck, in the, in the lorry, uh, two and a half meters, what they usually do. And we had to ask them when we started to collect the, uh, the wood for the project to keep it longer. Um, every borough of Amsterdam has its own uh, tree uh, administration. And they also have different trees. So although this, this is the, uh, the canals, although this looks all very regular and straight, 
Uh, obviously, there is much more. There are also uh, private trees that are not even on this map. Uh, so you can imagine that it's different in the old uh, city, uh, the channels. It's different than in a post-war uh, area like um, Buitenvelder or uh, New West. And there is also a different sort of trees. Uh, but the canals, the elm trees, that's what we were after mostly. So I want my next picture. Um, we were going to work with undried timber. Now, that's because we didn't have time to have it properly dried. And also, um, it was experimental. It was nice uh, to, uh, to try and see what you can do. Um, undried means there will be shrinkage. Uh, there may be a deformation. Uh, it is heavier than dry timber and you, have, you may have a mold issue, obviously. Um, so if timber is dried you know, uh, in a kiln, in, in, a, in a building that's heated and, and meant you know, to dry timber, it can reach 15%. If it's meant for furniture inside the house, you even want 10%, but wind dried, means you go down to about 18% of humidity, relative humidity content. And what helps a building obviously that's outside and freestanding is hot summer days, or at least dry hot summer days and dry winter days. Because when it's dry outside, your building dries out. If you have a, a, a moist hot summer day, obviously that's not going to do it for you. Um, the drying process only starts once the timber has been properly stacked with spacers in between and no sawdust, you know, the, 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 the sawdust has to be uh, wiped off. Um, and most of the deformation that takes place is at the end, the, both the end of the timber and the end of the, of the drying period, you know. In the middle, uh, it's less, less of an issue. And you can expect a total shrinkage of tangential, which is the direction where you have most shrinkage, up to 8%, which would be from totally wet to totally dry. And obviously we only start working with the timber when it's already in the process of drying. Um, and the longitudinal 0.8%. Nonetheless, you know, we had to deal with this. This is the site location. So it's a circular pond in the middle of the park. And we had the option uh, for uh, Stadthau to produce this about 500 meters away. So you can see on the left here, uh, at the lower end of the park, there is a facility by the, uh, the borough where Stadthau was able to uh, prepare all the pieces and then it would be brought to site uh, with these uh, forklift trucks. So that was very convenient. Um, I have to say something about the design. So when you have to design something that's not supposed to uh, have a problem with shrinkage, uh, then you probably resort to triangular uh, structures because then you have something that is dimension stable and um, you don't get into strange um, uh, geometries that, that may, may cause you know, a problem. Uh, so this, this is the way um, we designed it. And of course you have these nodes where all these points come together. I'll get to that later. Uh, we made a computer drawing. Um, it's not easy to know exactly how the geometry uh, works, but you need to know exactly. And uh, Elm is a, is a workable um, kind of tree where you can actually cut something in angles under two in two directions. Uh, we also decided to put the uh, V-shaped feet outward at the bottom. So you get something that's overall, you know, more stable, as you can imagine. So uh, that was the main concept for structure. And the structural engineer calculated um, Peter's Bau Technique uh, in Haarlem. Um, they have a lot of experience with timber. They calculated this and they... Um, it is such that it's actually um, uh, dimensioned on deflection and not on strength. So um, you don't get into issue, is this uh, timber strong enough? It's actually pretty uh, well dimensioned in the first place. Uh, and uh, there are these clamps, these joints, and they are also always um, 
um, um, they are always under um, tension so that it's never, oh, sorry, always under compression so it never becomes tension. So the way one beam is uh, hung into the other, you know, is such that even if it shrinks, it will just um, uh, stay that way. It won't become difficult. Here you can see it. So it's like hung into the steel clamp. Um, and if there is a bit of shrinkage, it will just still hang into that steel clamp. Um, here from different direction, as you can see, it's all, uh, you know, exact geometry. Um, things come together. This is the most complicated angle with five uh, uh, things coming together in one piece. And this is the 3D computer model, obviously, with all the elements exactly drawn, which was then, you know, still had to be translated to 2D drawings for it to be exactly built and not with a CNC, but, you know, by people by hand. So here are uh, the slots in the beams that have been overdimensioned to accommodate the shrinkage of the timber around that steel um, clamp that's going in, the fin that's going in. You can also see that we left space for uh, the welds in the steel. So the uh, triangular you know, endings are the welds in the steel, um, the place where those have to be accommodated. And then there is the roof, and we designed it such that the zinc, um, uh, the closed wings of the roof, the zinc can slide over. So it is connected at the middle, but it is left to slide over at the end. And the details are also such that you don't trap moisture. So it's either, you know, the steel here is clamped together, the, the timber and the steel completely clamped together, but at the bottom there is a seam and that means that you can, you know, moisture can run off and doesn't uh, stay uh, trapped. Um, and obviously we put the whole thing on a, a concrete base, which keeps us safely away from the pond and the water uh, in there, and which also creates the nice, uh, you know, podium idea. Here you can see a top view of the roof and the section. When you walk around the building, it changes constantly. And it uh, has the highest uh, side towards the audience. Uh, and of course, we needed the computer model to establish how exactly the drainage is. So where exactly the water goes, whether you know, uh, uh, one flap is, 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 is just inclined upward, the other one just inclined downward, uh, something had to be established in the exact computer drawing. And once we had established that, we knew where to put the spouts that, uh, you know, projects the water into the pond away from the timber. Okay, so then uh, we get towards uh, the uh, production of the building. This is the logo that I came up with uh, to explain to people what's happening. So trees from city get cut. Then they get, you know, they go through the uh, Stotzhout saw and then they come out and they become something nice. Um, Stotzhout was involved from the beginning. They are very knowledgeable also in the details they, uh, they were, you know, uh, involved. And they also made their own model to, in order to understand the structure, which is kind of a puzzle, um, especially at the ends where things come together, you know, it needs to be uh, exact. This is Rien. Uh, Rien uh, uh, was the, man, the, the one in charge of cutting all the uh, pieces and he did that with the, uh, you know, um, like, like a surgeon, you know, really uh, exact and precise and uh, asked me a lot of questions about it. And we had to, you know, adjust our drawings um, to be exactly right. And then um, after, you know, um, drawing the exact angles on the timber, then um, you can see that elm tree is a nice, uh, you know, homogeneous tree that, you know, can be, can be worked. Then, of course, um, they needed to, to do that. So they needed special tools in order to work the timber. So um, here you see uh, the drawings of the steel joints showing again that everything has to be exact. And actually the steel was more uh, difficult than the timber. 
um, here are the foot pieces where we decided to um, lift those uh, V wings up put them in place and then make the concrete footing below after that so that we would know exactly it was right. And here are the top uh, pieces go in under angles. And also here we did try this out because we were not too sure it would work. You can't, you know, wait until you're on the site and then maybe it doesn't fit. And we marked up all the elements. We thought it's nice to do, but it also is necessary because with these uh, edge pieces, if you have six different ones that are all kind of similar, you really don't know uh, which, you're, which one you need. So these are uh, the crosses. We had them uh, come to sites before they were galvanized because we wanted to be sure that they were right. And once we said, yes, they are, uh, you know, they are right. They do fit. They are exactly made, you know, only to measure this is already difficult. You know, when you're on the side, okay, uh, can you check this element, whether it's it's been made correctly? It's difficult to even measure, let alone to fit it. But we got there. Uh, these are the edge sorts, you know, lying in a circle. So they're going to be, um, well, they're numbered, obviously. Um, so they fit exactly in the timber. And then, of course, the choice of the timber. This is the long saw that um, Stadshout got somewhere in Poland. They were able to buy it. Um, it's 11 meters long, so you can have very uh, long pieces of timber uh, cut in there. So here you see their uh, big yard with the, the big trunks lying there and some cut pieces at the end. And um, Griso here uh, on, the, on the saw. So he has a feel for, you know, what pieces are straight and what pieces may warp. And sure enough, there was the one or another that did warp, so we would have to renew it. And these are the tools that they got um, somewhere. It's like a special big uh, uh, drill that you put completely on top uh, of the beam, and then you can make a straight uh, hole. I mean, you don't have to try to do this with, a you know, like a a normal um, Black & Decker uh, drill, you know, it has to be serious stuff, uh, which they invested in, and then they could make the right holes. And then of course, there's still uh, the question, how do I then uh, create um, these exact angles of everything? So they made the kind of casing uh, which they could adjust in two directions. And then they had this uh, chainsaw on a rail, you know, with little uh, screws fixed to cut this exactly. So you see, it's not uh, easy to make this by hand. This is not only a project with raw material, but it's also, it's not exactly CNC, you know, it's uh, all by hand and uh, quite exact. Um, now, as I said, the pieces, they uh, tend to have more shrinkage or more moisture comes out at the end. When we started, when you would put a tree vertical, you know, a trunk, the water would run out. So they were uh, soaking wet to start with. By this time, they were already, you know, cut, uh, dried for a while, you know, out in the sun. But still, we have to treat the edges um, with wax uh, so that they don't, um, uh, that not, too much water comes out too quickly and it starts to, uh, to give uh, um, creases. So we are slowly getting towards um, the um, site. The elements have been prepared. The base is waiting for us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, pieces have been brought there. Um, here's a stack of pieces, numbered and well. And here are two of the V-shaped legs, and they have, of course, a, a spacer. Now, um, this timber, as I say, is pretty strong, so it's not, um, no worries there, but it's good to keep it uh, exact space. And here they start to assemble um, these, uh, these, these crosses with members. And obviously uh, we already had the crane there and the crane driver was important to us because, because he knows uh, how things shift, how weights shift and how they are in balance. So um, uh, he was, he was uh, really important. Um, 
here again, starting to fit something. Um, this is an edge sort. Now you see a little line run uh, above the sort. You can see a horizontal uh, line, and that's because we anticipated where there would be uh, cracking in the timber. And then if you make an um, incision yourself, then you uh, have, you know, you have taken care of that. So uh, I'll get back to that. But these are some of the visitors on site. Obviously, also this became a little bit of a social project with Facebook page and a lot of people. Um, paying interest. This is one of the more difficult corners. And this is where it's all on the floor. And I remember being here and then realizing that I wasn't completely sure whether the last one, if, there, if, if, if most of them are in place, whether the last one actually still uh, would fit in. Um, I just wasn't sure, but it, it did. So I'm very happy. So here you can see you have a real uh, crew of people helping. Um, no words here. This is taken from the crane from above. And then there is the moment where uh, it gets lifted up uh, to be placed. So as you can see, two of the uh, V-shaped legs are already there, and then it would be placed. And then, you know, the concrete would be poured for the feet, feet and then um, will be released. So here we are, mounting it. And then we left it for a while to shrink. It's a bit like a, a green oak building in, in England where you, uh, that would stay for a, a year or so before they would start filling in. But uh, we, we waited for um, maybe a month it was there. And then in the meantime, we we're preparing some other uh, parts. Uh, before we started cladding, so that it would have taken its shape by the time we did that. So here we are uh, with secondary beams, and here you see again that vertical um, incision in there. And now you see why we did that. Um, you can anticipate that if you have a, a timber a trunk, that the outside is going to shrink more than the inside. So this is what mostly happens, uh, is that you get uh, this kind of um, thing happening. So if you anticipate that by making uh, an incision on the outside, then, you know, it's controlled. So this is the whole structure in place, waiting and uh, drying and shrinking. And here we have already um, the center um, um, roof uh, clad and, and, the, and the wing. Here you see the wing from above. Um, the diagonal here, the diagonal line there is a consequence of the geometry. So this is not a trapezoid, but it's, 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 in, it's two triangles that are almost like a trapezoid. Um, the poplar has been uh, uh, sawn roughly, so it's not smooth, which is good for the zinc. So there is some air uh, in between. And the planks are laid at a difference, uh, at a space. You know, there's also always a space between the planks so that the, uh, the zinc can, can, can air. And as you can see, the zinc is being attached at the middle, but not at the edge. Um, now you see the zinc is, uh, is going on and there is the, um, the, the triangular, you know, the, the, the point where the triangles meet, which is the difficult point. Um, very good zinc people who, uh, who were quite professional and linking the pieces and, and, and doing it all uh, on site to measure. Nothing to be, um, you know, prefabricated here. It all had to be done right there. So here you can see and the cladding of the piece in the middle. Uh, the edge for the edge, uh, the edge uh, uh, cover, uh, we had uh, small vertical pieces also to create, you know, aeration so that uh, air would be able to go out. Because we knew, uh, you know, there may be a little bit of mold. If you see here that piece you're looking at, it has a little bit of black uh, pits. But so there is part of mold. Mold is not always uh, an, uh, something alarming. There is, can be a little bit of it, but eventually you don't want to trap water anywhere. So here are the glazed triangles going on. 
uh, they were held by clamps. Uh, here you can see uh, a clamp. Um, now we did have one piece where we had glass breakage. So this is the clamp in detail here. So the idea is there's a big heavy rubber support and then there is a, a clamp. Uh, but at one point we had uh, breakage and then had to be uh, redone. Um, but overall it went well. Here view from below. Looking into the, uh, into the, the central um, uh, roof light, skylight, which is also has, has an acoustic uh, uh, added value. So it's, it's a acoustically very good building. And then it started to be used by you know, local musicians and it was a lot of fun. There were concert series. Uh, as you can see, the high side is towards the audience consciously uh, done. The benches are also made of studs out, but then, you know, just rough planks. And there is a, a grand piano and that has a cover. It's being taken away every winter. Now, grand pianos obviously are not made of undried shrinking timber and they are not meant to be uh, outside in changing uh, temperature uh, and moisture conditions. So that's why it has a protection cover, uh, but still it uh, works well and it gets taken uh, at the end of the season, gets taken by Theodore Decker, uh, who um, takes it back and, and takes care of it. Um, that is basically uh, the project. So I think we'll have uh, time for some questions. Thank you.